Okay, it looks like we're a little after, uh, about two after three. So um, good afternoon uh, or good morning or good evening from wherever you're joining. Welcome to today's uh, local development uh, forum webinar, mass layoffs and local impacts, what we know and what can be done. Um, so uh, for those joining us uh, for the first time, the local development forum is a, uh, a network of thousands of economic development employment practitioners around the world. Um, and this is part of our uh, program at the OEC, the Local um, Employment and Economic Development Program, which is the, started 40 years ago here at the OECD to really give a local lens to important employment and economic development issues. So we're pleased to have uh, today's uh, event with a focus on um, mass layoffs and really local impacts. What does this mean for different uh, groups and places? Um, and I know we're coming in the context of rising uh, living costs, energy costs, uh, labor shortages, but uh, mass layoffs are still a consideration for many, uh, many regions across the OECD. And so we're here to talk with a distinguished panel about, um, about these topics. Now, just as a reminder, we have a, a chat function here in the, the Zoom platform. So don't hesitate to just jump in and say, you know, where you're um, dialing in from and uh, what organization you're with so we can get to to get you involved in the exchange. And also that um, we have uh, a question and answer um, opportunity uh, because there'll be a lot of time for discussion. So don't hesitate um, as you're listening to discussions um, of the panelists and um, as you're thinking uh, through the debates uh, to, to put in your, your questions and we'll, we'll get to those uh, Throughout the, throughout the discussion. So um, today's uh, event will be broken out into sort of two sets of, of panels. So if we could just see the next slide and I'd love to introduce the, um, the, the great lineup of speakers we have. So we'll first have a couple of colleagues here who will set the context given some of the research they're doing. So uh, Vessel Vermeulen, who is an economist here at the OECD and our Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. Um, and he's uh, actually coming in from our Trento Center um, out of Italy, where we have a special spatial productivity lab doing a lot of different research on um, labor and productivity issues with a spatial lens. We also will have uh, Victor Tan Chen, who's Associate Professor of Sociology at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University and Virginia in the United States, who's been doing a lot of research, um, if, for example, looking at uh, what has happened in communities where a lot of auto workers have been laid off, both in uh, the US and in Canada, and some other research he'll bring to the to the debate. And then we'll have another um, group of uh, panelists who are going to jump in and uh, really talk to us about some of their um, experiences in their countries and their um, regions um, and uh, the kinds of activities that they're doing. So we're pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Johannes Kopf, the head of the Austrian Public Employment Service of Austria, who's going to talk to us um, about a very unique approach they have with labor foundations that support both in-placement and outplacement. Um, we'll hear more about that in a moment. Um, we have Muriel Lanty, who is a senior vice president uh, for government and industry affairs at Lee Hecht Harrison, part of the ADECO group. And sure, her company works with a lot of different places and companies in supporting these kinds of transitions. We also um, welcome Julian Martinez, Perahano, who is a technical advisor of the Just Transition Institute and the Ministry of Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge in Spain, talking about some of the programs they have that are supporting mass layoffs. Um, and we also have joining us from the United States, Taylor Stuckert, who is the executive director of the Clinton County Regional Planning Commission uh, in Ohio, uh, out of the United States, who's going to tell us about a, a particular case of a, a massive ma layoff in, in his community and some of the economic development lessons they've learned uh, as a result. Um, and Aria Nicola, who is a senior specialist in the Department of Regions and Growth Services in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and F Employment in Finland, who will share with us some of the kinds of uh, responses they've had with mass layoffs. And I think all of us have heard of the company Nokia, uh, who, has, uh, who has had some experiences in that um, space uh, in, in past years. So um, what we'd like to do is maybe start the debate. So I'm going to welcome Vessel and Victor to the, uh, to the virtual stage here. Um, and uh, again, to all of those who are participating, don't hesitate to, uh, to jump in with uh, your comments in the chat and questions. So we'll start 
start uh, maybe Vessel with you because um, the OECD has done a work, uh, extensive work on the issues um, in general of mass layoffs and um, the active labor market policy responses. And um, I think we'll just ask colleagues to put a link to a report done by another group here at the OECD um, as part of the employment outlook where they did look at um, a lot of the international comparative data on this uh, across countries and some of the labor market policy responses. And Vessel, you have really been trying to take a deep dive into what does this mean for different places? And so could you maybe walk us through some of the research that uh, you're gonna be publishing soon, looking at kind of the incidents of, of mass layoffs in different regions and what is the sort of long-term impacts you're seeing on on these regional economies um yeah sure thanks thanks karen um i would be very happy to do that so uh the way that i'm going to do it is i'd like to just try make three points to set the scene of the discussion today and i'll structure those around three questions and the first question is what's the scale of the issue how many uh, of these, these mass layoffs do we actually see our, uh, across countries and time periods? And second question is, when and why have mass layoffs negative effects on, on people and regions? Because it might not be all, always the case that it is such a negative thing. So I'll just uh, talk a little bit through uh, some of the, 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 the reasons or, or mechanisms behind it that, that can give rise to uh, some negative outcomes. And then um, the third point that I would like to make is what is the effect of mass layoffs on workers and regions? Um, and I hope that gives us a little bit of an, a broad overview to, uh, to help us uh, talk also through the, the different cases and experiences that we're going to hear uh, uh, later. So first, what's the scale of the issue? So uh, in the research that, that we've done here at the OECD, um, uh, we used specifically data from uh, Eurofound. It's a, a European Union institution that tracked um, mass layoff announcements since 2002. It's called the European Restructuring Monitor. Uh, and there, mass layoffs are defined as a dismissal of at least 100 people or at least 10% of a workforce of uh, around 250 people. And in my own research, I also used higher thresholds. Uh, so sometimes even up to 250 uh, people being uh, affected in a specific region or all up to a half percentage of the local labor force or at least a half percentage of the local labor force. So even when you're using thresholds of mass layoffs that affect at least 150 people, there are over 100 cases each year in European regions, and there are, all, um, there are more than 50 regions that will be affected every year. So uh, this is something that is quite common uh, across the European Union, and in the United States, you will find uh, a very similar kind of number, although they will use slightly different data, but the idea is that it is just as common. We see some more cases during economic downturns. So, for instance, during the global financial crisis of 2007 and 2009, there were more of these events. But even during uh, years of economic growth, we see that mass layoffs are kind of a common feature. So, when and why have mass layoffs negative effect on people and regions? So, I'm, I'm trying to distinguish here three different hypothetical cases. I think mass layoffs can occur in different regional economic contexts, and not all of them mean that there is something inherently bad in a local economy. Uh, for instance, a badly performing firm may default, and then laid off workers are, of course, affected. But if they find employment in the region with healthy and growing firms, including with help of public employment services, both workers in the region might be better off because everyone uh, starts working in, in a place uh, in a better performing firm. But what if a well-performing firm decides to relocate its office or plant elsewhere uh, in another or in the same country, but perhaps in another place or even going abroad? And in this case, you might be concerned also about spillovers to other firms. For instance, local suppliers to a downsized or closed plant will also be negatively affected. So the challenge for workers to find similar stable and well-paid employment can also become harder because uh, there are consequences to the region. And as a third case, um, a mass layoffs might be a symptom or a consequence of a broader trend of uh, a regional manufacturing base. So in this case, a focus that only looks at the individual plant or, or firm and the affected firm and the affected workers may be a bit too narrow as the underlying issue is broader and it's more related to the long-term regional economic restructuring that needs to take place in a, in a region. And people affected by mass layoffs in, in a region that offers little alternative employment will likely face even greater challenges in finding new stable jobs. So what are the effects of mass layoffs on workers and regions? So there is quite of a rich 
uh, research literature that has covered this question quite well in recent years, using data from different countries, different periods, and selecting different uh, types of mass layers or mass layers because of different reasons. Um, and I think if I, if I may summarize it a very, uh, you know, liberally, I would say that mass layoffs negatively affect workers' uh, long-term wage growth, and this effect becomes larger the longer is the unemployment spell of, of affected workers. And additionally, workers at a lower organizational rank uh, with fewer formal degrees or lower formal degrees and with a higher age see relatively greater difficulties in reemployment. Therefore, also in their um, uh, in their reemployment and in their wage growth of, of the employment. Um, and people that look even a bit broader, they also find that mass layoffs can have a quite a negative consequences on personal health and also on the communities or families. Um, in, in our research that we did here at the OECD, we looked specifically at European regions and find that on average, mass layoffs lead to a persistent decrease in employment between 1% to 2% of the regional employment. Um, so this is quite of a, a strong effect from, for one, from one event that happens in a region. And mass layoffs that occur in preliminary, primarily rural areas tend to have stronger negative effects on employment than in urban and metropolitan regions which may be due to rural regions having relatively more shallow labor markets that make it hard to direct workers to suit for new employment. Um, and then the last thing that we looked at is uh, also regional economic productivity. So to what extent that the economy is affected uh, in the region overall, not just the labor market. The picture is a bit more complex than for employment. And then as a note that the characteristic of the firm and the characteristics of the region can both affect whether the region is resilient to mass layoffs. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hear the next speakers tell about their experiences and understand what are some of these factors that can mitigate uh, the negative consequence of mass layoffs of workers, communities, and regions. So just to recap, the three questions. What's the scale of the issue? It's quite large and very common across many countries during times of economic growth, as well as economic downturns. When and why mass layoffs negative, have negative effects on people and regions. So the ability of workers to find suitable employment is really key. So the regional economic base to absorb the workers that were affected and the resilience of a region to a single firm that closes or scales down um, are likely very important factors in, in understanding what are, uh, how strongly a region is affected. Uh, so what is the effect of mass layoffs? So really on average across time periods and countries, mass layoffs affect the region's employment quite negatively. And understanding better what public policies in different countries and different types of regions can do to mitigate the impact will be quite relevant for, for places that face the same challenge. So thank you, Kai. That was, that was my first setting of the scene. Great. Thank you so much, Vessel. And I should just maybe flag to everybody that your background is actually the background of the, the lovely Trento Center of the OECD um, in Trento, Italy, a former uh, uh, convent, correct? So. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much, Vessel. So um, thanks for giving us a sense of the, the sort of frequency and some of these long-term impacts on particular regional uh, labor markets, which um, some of the later speakers in the panels will also be able to speak directly to exactly how this has impacted uh, those communities and what has been done. Um, I'm excited to welcome Victor Tanchen. Um, and Victor, you've been doing a lot of uh, research looking at um, different sides of the North American border between America and Canada, in particular in a sector that has experienced mass layoffs, such as automotive. So, um, Victor, why don't you tell us a little bit about the research and the kind of comparative situations of different groups and communities that you've observed in your research? Sure, and, and thank you to Karen, Anna Rubin, and Sorrell Stewart for organizing this and inviting me. Um, so for my book, Cut Loose, I interviewed and observed long-term unemployed auto workers in Detroit and Windsor, which are two car-making cities on the U.S.-Canadian border. And I wanted to understand how individuals, families, and communities were experiencing the wave of unemployment unleashed by the global financial crisis. The idea was to focus on policies and cultures on either side of the border, and examine how and why uh, they made a difference. For these brief comments, um, I wanna build on Vessel's thoughtful presentation to look in a more granular fashion on the impacts of mass layoffs. So as research has found, 
Long-term unemployment hits people with a psychological and social blow that is comparable to divorce and the death of a loved one. Work is so central to who we are. It gives us a sense of our importance, of our social contribution. It provides a structure and a meaning to our lives. Many of my interviewees express shame and self-blame about being unemployed for so long. Now, this wasn't usually an issue right after they lost their jobs, but as weeks dragged into months and months even into years, a sense of failure and despair took hold of them. Take Gary, an American worker who lost his job at a car parts factory. Afterward, Gary and his wife started arguing often about money. At times, the stress became so much that Gary wanted to disappear. Quote, just be a bird and fly, as he put it to me. He said he probably should be seeing a therapist, but given the patchwork healthcare system we have here, Gary could afford insurance for himself and his wife and his two children. They were left to fend for themselves. The problem was Gary never finished high school. Like many working class young people in industrial towns, Gary got a job at the plant with his dad's help. He had been there just two months when his glove got caught in a machine and a chain ripped off three of his fingers. Even after his accident, Gary stuck with his job. It was just too hard to give up those good factory wages. Gary insists that he had no control over the loss of his job, but when he talks to his family and feels their disappointment, he can't help but blame himself. Quote, I think about my past and mistakes I made, he said, like the time that I felt getting money was more important than my education. Man, if I had focused my attention somewhere else, I could be somewhere else now. My research found that Canada's universal health care and generous job retraining programs made it easier to cope with long-term unemployment. Support for working families, especially single parents with children, went a long way to help the kinds of households usually hit hardest by unemployment. I want to emphasize here that income supports are an important part of helping workers transition from job loss. But cultural and psychological supports also matter greatly. Indeed, the unemployed American workers tended to feel more self-blame, which may have to do with the more individualistic culture here. And this is important because the workers I talked to with the most intense problems uh, dealing with unemployment, those who were suicidal or taking antidepressants, had a high degree of regret and self-blame. In fact, in more recent research, I'm examining these potential links between unemployment and so-called deaths of despair, suicides and drug overdoses that have spiked in the United States, the UK, and other countries. I also found more self-blame among unemployed workers who were not closely connected to organizations like unions through programs like action centers that are sponsored by unions and staffed by their unemployed workers, unions can offer a crucial source of social support. Take John, another American former auto worker. As a child growing up in Alabama, John was abandoned by his young parents. He never finished school. Instead, he moved to Detroit and found a job in a unionized plant. But John was not really a fan of the union. He blamed it for protecting the interests of mediocre workers. He didn't see unions or governments as any kind of savior. Instead, he relied on himself. Quote, as long as you believe you're going to be all right, he told me. Keep a smile on your face. Keep your head up. But as we continued our conversation, John began to break down. Quote, to me, it's real bad, he said, because my job was like my mother and father to me. It's all I had, you know. All my life, I depended on my job as my mother and father. If I could only make it every day, I know I'm all right. His company's decision to terminate him 
wounded John, but he never really blamed the company. They were just doing what made business sense. And yet as John's unemployment dragged on, his inability to side with the union against the corporation that had laid him off meant that the anger fell on him. It's all my fault, he said. Finally, my research suggested how both policies and culture mattered in how mass layoffs affected communities. Job losses had multiplier effects that went far beyond individual households. Restaurants and retail stores were obviously affected by the loss of clientele, but so were charities, advocacy groups, and other nonprofits that relied upon generous individual donations and volunteers, both of which are reduced by long-term joblessness. This had cascading effects on the capacities that communities had to help their most vulnerable citizens. Furthermore, recent research links job losses in a community to higher rates of mortality, including drug overdoses, and changes in rates of marriage, childbirth outside marriage, and child poverty. What I also saw in my research was a larger culture of judgment that blamed the unemployed and poor for their predicament and attacked unions and government policies that sought to support them. This culture, which was stronger on the American side, made the situation needlessly political and hindered pragmatic approaches to deal with the unemployment crisis. In conclusion, differences in both policy and culture matter for how individuals and communities cope with mass layoffs, and we need to be attentive to all these factors. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Victor. So really a nice uh, compliment to uh, the presentation of Vessel where we had a sense of sort of some of the uh, some of the numbers associated with it and Victor to really see the spill off uh, spillover effects on people, communities, their families that you found through your sociological research and um, and you mentioned uh, some of the economic uh, some of the economists that have been talking about deaths of despair in these communities that have been hard hit um, and and also I think you know in some of the the work. Um, Good economy, uh, good economics for hard times with uh, some recent Nobel Prize winners where um, they and others have been arguing that maybe we are not sufficiently measuring the, the full extent of these other social and community impacts in our models. And we need to think a lot more about those as we consider policies and what are the effects that these have uh, when we don't uh, maybe do a little bit more uh, upfront preparation, um, et cetera. So hopefully we can delve into some of those a bit more in the panel discussion. And I just remind all the participants, don't hesitate if you have very specific questions also for Vessel and Victor to start putting those into the, the comment mode. Um, uh, through our question and answer, so we can um, start pulling together those uh, those um, questions to the panelists. So I think now we're going to turn to the sort of practical responses. Uh, now that we've heard a little bit about the research, um, both from an economic and a, a sociological perspective, um, so I'd like to start. Um, as I mentioned, we have um, several speakers coming from uh, from Austria, from the private sector, from Spain, from uh, the U.S. and from Finland. So um, maybe if we could start with Mr. Johannes Kopp, who is head of the Austrian Public Employment Service, and um, Austria has really um, a very interesting system with labor foundations that can be developed for particular firms, places, etc. Um, so Johannes, um, welcome very much to this um, to this webinar. We really look forward to hearing a little bit about this Austrian model that uh, has a lot of inspiring lessons for other other countries and places. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, it's, um, yeah, I would say some kind of best practice example that I'm convinced of, I'd, I'd like to introduce to you uh, today. Uh, it's the so-called labor foundations in Austria. It's an instrument we yeah, developed decades ago uh, to support structural economic changes and adjustments uh, to the labor market uh, needs of job seekers. Uh, it's an instrument with a strong involvement of the social partners, which, are, which play a very crucial role in, in, in Austria. Um, and um, um, 
in fact, it's an instrument that was set up when a large group of people uh, is to be affected by staff reductions with one company, one big company, or even with a, with a whole sector. Um, for instance, think of the mining industry in the past or so. Um, um, labor foundations are, were also uh, invented or later on developed for, for another situation. So one is in case of mass layoffs, but the other is also in case of a large number of workers, of workers are needed. Uh, think of, for instance, um, I remember um, in, in, in a certain part of Austria, uh, thermal water was found and uh, it was planned to have a, a huge thermal hotel, thermal uh, uh, um, bath. Um, and uh, it was clear they will build up here a, 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 a huge uh, tourist facility, hotel and so on. And in about one and a half year, two years, they will need, um, I don't know, 200 people with certain uh, skills to to work there in 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 yeah at the countryside in fact it was and so on so it also it is also an instrument of training people um, when um, there is a certain need for certain skills and people in within a certain region but let me start because we are talking about mass layoffs today um, about our outplacement foundations as we call them um, it's um, a, a a program that is mostly in cooperation with the employers. Uh, in the early stage of redundancy, and they are when normally companies are, um, want to lay off a lot of people, they start with negotiations. They start with negotiations with trade unions, with their employee representations, and so on. Um, and uh, we call these um, uh, foundations company foundation. Um, the company is still working, but uh, has to lay off a certain amount of people and so on. Uh, it's often launched by companies as I would say part of a social plan. Normally people get paid, I don't know, for some month um, their uh, loans uh, for a longer time and so on. But and, and another measure is such uh, the founding of such a company foundation. Um, um, and there's of course another form, it's an insolvency foundation in case of insolvency of enterprises and so on. Um, there are certain foundations also when, when the whole sector, um, think of, I don't know, the textile industry uh, that, uh, yeah, got lost <laughs> in Europe or in, in, in the middle of Europe and so on. This is mostly launched by employer organizations um, to cushion the effects of economic uh, difficulties of, of a certain specific sector. And we do also know regional foundations, um, um, mostly launched by several companies and regional uh, authorities of a sp specific region, um, all affected by major staff cuts and so on. Um, to, to make it clear, I'd like to give you one concrete example. We had an, a huge construction film firm, it was called Alpine, a, a construction company that, yeah, uh, spent too much money and didn't earn enough. Um, it, it was an insolvency foundation. Now we had the problem in 2013. Um, it was um, clear that about, I think at that time, it was about 6,000 people, workers, mostly men, male workers, were be, uh, affected of layoffs. Um, it was clear at that time that um, the construction sector was not so bad. So a lot of other companies are, showed interest in taking people up. But of course, there was fear. Uh, and there was in, in, uncertainty and, and the people didn't feel uh, well and so on. So we planned an insolvency foundation as public employment service. We have also always been part of the game. Um, um, it was the, in the planning, we always, we tend to plan it bigger than it, there is need because um, you don't know how many people will uh, manage to go strictly to another job, to another company and so on. Um, we were planning um, um, about past contribution of, of about 2.9 million euros. Um, 1.7 is for training. So most of the money is always spent for training. The rest for other measures such as job, job search support or uh, certain benefits and so on. Um, we of course agreed on something like success criteria. 70% um, of the participants should be employed after three months. Um, after exiting the foundation and the normal, it's concrete. In, in concrete, it's about um, um, yeah, training um, and developing the skills of the unemployed people. Um, 
to, to find the job in, in a different sector or at a different company. Um, Alpine, I like this example because labor market was excellent, taking many, many people up. At the end, the maximal participants were planned 700. At the end, there were just about 60 participants, um, about 50 of them uh, uh, successful completed their training measures to learn, in many cases, completely different uh, uh, professions. Um, and we had a success. We didn't reach 70%, but we reached 66% of the people were back in employment three months after exiting the foundation. Um, I think um, this, this was a, a big success because we gave hundreds or even thousands of people I would say a feeling of security. There is somewhere, someone where that will really help me to, to, if I can't find a job, to develop my skills, to to, to get trained and to to start some somewhere else um, within another company. What is a speciality of these foundations is every person who is in the foundation keeps his unemployment benefits. Um, up to at least the whole time he's, he's trained. So it could be also three years um, uh, where the training takes three years. We will pay unemployment benefits for the whole duration um, in the same high uh, as at the beginning of the unemployment. So um, um, we also, I told you also, we have emplacement foundations. Um, they are used to address specific, special shortages. Uh, it's provided by one or several employers in the region where or a sector. Uh, affected by major manpower shortages and so on. Um, it's always a program and is also on based all this foundation um, established um, after negotiations of the social partners and of the other actors involved. So the companies, the social partner, the public employment service, often also the federal government. And this brings me, I would say, to the most interesting point I would presume for you is, is the financing or funding of these, uh, 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 of these labor foundations. Um, the costs have to be covered um, at, at, at a huge amount by the involved company. Um, and um, or the territorial authorities. We want them to be partner because this is a regional territorial problem. And we also want them to, 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 to show it up with financing. And of course, also the public employment service, my organization um, uh, is, is a co-financier. Uh, in the outplacement foundation, um, the funding's available for career guidance and training um, 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 pay mostly the work of external providers. Um, they assist people by their job search, um, uh, by their training, and, and the company pays the related costs. We, as a public employment service, pay the unemployment benefits, even for a longer time than on normal. In the emplacement foundations is also of costs. Um, 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 there are a lot of costs that have to be fund, uh, uh, taken by the companies that need the people after two years. So think of a factory, a huge factories built someone where, and then they need technicians for it. So we, we train them one and a half year before they open the company and so on. Um, the funding ranges from 35 to 60 percent uh, from the companies. Of course, in, a, in the case of insolvency, uh, only the public, uh, uh, public hand pays the costs because the company is uh, already gone down. Um, and um, as I said, we can uh, pay the unemployment benefits um, up to uh, three years. If the training takes longer or the participants are more uh, older than 50, uh, we can pay even to the uh, amount of four years. Uh, unemployment uh, benefits and the people with that are within the labor foundation get some i would say small extra money uh, to cover training related additional expenses um, so this is about 60 euros a month and so on all in all it's a very successful instrument that is developed and worked for decades and i would say this is a best practice example from austria thank you Thank you so much, Johannes. Maybe just a quick follow-up question. Um, in your experience, um, you know, you mentioned a lot of the different training opportunities that can also take um, several years. Um, what's been your experience with maybe some of the older workers um, or workers that maybe didn't have um, an educational background that allowed them to shift as easily? Um, there's always questions about what what 
you know, maybe some younger workers, it's easier to shift than older workers. I don't know if you have any, um, any reflections or thoughts on that particular yeah. group. Um, it, it really depends. There is no overall answer because it really depends on labor market situation, region and labor market needs. Um, in some cases, think of, I don't know, textile workers. Um, we wouldn't be able to place them as textile workers anymore. So it's really about learning a new profession. Uh, and that could be something that has an interest that has gone lost during uh, becoming an adult. Uh, for instance, in the techni techni a technical uh, interest, or it could be, I don't know, in the health sector or something like that. So really often a complete different profession. In other cases, it's um, a think of industry worker, where with the right qualification in, 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 with, in with, I would say, low skilled people, it's often only about six months a year. It's just, I would say, something like an upskilling uh, to work on a CNC mas machine, for instance, or something like that, or welding, certain more than welding professions, uh, skills or such, such a thing. But you're right, it's not easy and not everyone says, yeah, training, that's great. <laughs> um, so it's also often, and that's what I also call uh, these additional costs. It's also a question of working with the people, showing up chances, consultancy, giving advice, convincing them that there is need and it's, it's useful um, to, to learn something else and so on. Uh, and then they also need a placement uh, service, of course. Uh, in, in, in a good market situation that like Alpine, in my example, it was very easy. I mean, 60 people were left and 6,000 were, were, were uh, affected by the layoff. Six, six, this is, I mean, 1%. Uh, this was easy. I remember another huge uh, uh, foundation, labor foundation. This was an, a very small, I would say, old, small food uh, uh, supermarket. Uh, and there were small shops and there was no investment for a long time. And they were all over Austria, but they were all too small to really make money. Uh, and then it was sold to another investor, but he had not really money and he invested a bit, not enough to modernize his shops, to modernize the IT system, to train their people and so on. Uh, and they were all over Austria, and even in small regions. Uh, and when they closed their shops, this was hard. Many of the workers were unqualified women, mostly at the age over 50. So it was even harder to, to, to find something. And in many cases, there, there was no alternative company. There was no supermarket then in this small village. It, it was closed and this was off. So, and with these programs, but we found, gave them IT courses and suddenly they found somewhere in, a, in an office, they found a place or in another shop for selling clothes, they just needed to have, I would say, an IT school, uh, IT uh, course for um, uh, in the trade sector, the new, uh, I don't know, billing system or, or online trading or such things. Uh, but yes, of course, in some cases, it, it doesn't work also. But it's a really good example. And, and one thing is very important. They get the money, the unemployment benefit for the whole time to make a completely new profession could last up to four years, which is not bad, especially for training someone to the health sector, for instance, even if they are 50. So they can three or four years learn a complete new profession. This was all invented by closing of state industry uh, from mining, from, from metal in the, in the 80s, where huge companies with too high uh, wages were not competitive on the world market anymore. There it was invented. And now we use it and I, it's often really that the people will not get the practice uh, depressive, like Victor said. There is some one word that really helps him, give him a new opportunity, give him training, give their daily structure and so on. So we are really, we're quite happy with that instrument. 
Great, thank you so much, Johannes. Um, we're gonna move on to the next panelist, but I just wanted to flag that uh, I think uh, there uh, is interest in learning a bit more about these uh, issues you raised on the territorial approach and um, what to do in maybe the more rural, less dense labor market. So maybe we'll we'll hold that for the, the group discussion um, for all of us, but just to, to flag that um, in the background. Um, and next we have Muriel Anti. Um, so Muriel, uh, um, uh, I think what would be really great, you're Senior Vice President of Government and Industry Affairs at Lee Heck Terrace, and, and you're dialing in from Zurich today, is that right? Yes. yes. So, right. So welcome, Miriam. Um, you do a lot of work with uh, different locations, different companies, et cetera, when they're going through these kinds of processes. Could you explain a bit more about the kind of work that, that your company does and some, you know, an example of how this has um, really helped uh, in a situation that's a bit challenging with a, a mass layoff? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today and delighted to uh, well, contribute to, uh, to the conversation with our perspective from, um, from our work, um, enabling about half a million individuals to find new jobs or reinvent their career, as we sometimes say. So not, not everybody is in the same, uh, in the same situation. Um, so this makes us, uh, among other things, if you ask me who, who we are, the largest private provider of career transitions globally. So very much, so my perspectives are very much from a, you know, practitioner lens and I can relate a, a lot to what, um, to what Johannes, you, what you said, um, because this is kind of, uh, our work is, is um, entirely, I mean, with, with, uh, with exceptions where we work outside of our, um, let's say, core activities, um, uh, where we work in, in public-private um, partnerships on, on reintegration of long-term unemployed and, and others, which is a fair amount of, of, of uh, uh, projects. But, but basically, our work and, and, and the way we enable organization and their workforce to transition is financed um, by businesses. And if, and yeah, I mean, one of the things, uh, because I, I, I think to, to relate to what um, other um, panelists said uh, earlier, right? I think uh, we all agree that, that mass layoffs, A, are not uh, really that, I mean, layoffs in general, uh, let's uh, put aside even, even mass layoffs. Uh, it's, it's not something that anybody would want to see uh, uh, and let alone uh, be, be, uh, be part of or be, be impacted by. Um, but mass layoffs are often not to be entirely reconsidered. Nevertheless, we um, see ourselves in the position to, uh, to encourage businesses to think of alternatives to layoffs. So that, that's something that is really critical for us as we are standing in to, uh, for, for the, uh, for the individuals and for their um, experience um, through, through the, the case. Now, we've seen, and I think you alluded to it, Karen, right? We, uh, it, it, it changes over time in terms of how many mass layoffs do we see, et cetera. We, see, we have seen a, a clear evolution since 2020 with, let's say, very little mass layoffs. Um, we are expecting, or our clients are saying that, um, you know, they are getting ready, but they don't quite want to do it as much as they can. They would hold on to, to not doing this. So that means um, we kind of have a, a bit of a window of opportunity to also think hard. And I think that's great to have this conversation. It's about the learnings and how we can enhance, uh, let's say, the systematic approach and leverage the, the, the practices that we, we, we find in, in a lot of countries and, and different organizations. Um, to kind of you know do this differently or at least uh, enhance the well the experience but but also kind of find new ways of, of of solving that because one thing one other thing is also clear is that when organization uh, go to layoff they also are starting to think differently about it um, and i'm happy to share uh, one 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 example where we were able to in the automotive industry to shift their mindsets about they started with i think there were five or six thousand people uh, to be laid off. So yes, a mass layoff. Um, and by talking to them, sitting down and looking at the alternative, why they were doing this, because I think this is also important, right? Is this because massive cost cutting and restructuring scenario, or is it um, because of skills transformation needs? And in this case, it was skills transformation. And, and we managed, thanks to you know, uh, pulling in the, the entire ecosystem with public funding opportunities, but also thinking more about reskilling scenario, 
the company ended up you know, going away from a mass layoff to a actually a large scale up and reskilling scenario. So I think there are um, options there. And, and, and I think this is also something uh, beside the fact of you know, talking about what is our experience and learnings from mass layoff. I think one thing is also to think about how we, what we can do to kind of uh, you know, have the, 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 explore the alternatives. Now, when it comes to what we do, so I think there are three main activities to put it, um, to, to make it easy to understand. Um, the core is certainly when it comes to layoffs, the core is the transition of individuals. Um, so yes, we work with uh, you know, transfer companies in, in Germany and, and other types of, uh, of models that exist across, uh, across the globe. There are some uh, companies, uh, there are some uh, countries where um, actually supporting a a people in transition or after a layoff is mandatory. If you look at Spain, it's from, six, from 50 uh, um, um, layoffs onwards. Uh, the company has to finance um, a, a support or enabling um, the transition. So <clears throat> it's a different model than, than we have in, in Austria, but you know, so, some, some, uh, some different models across, across the globe. Now, our business is, or, or our, our um, core activities around um, you know, supporting uh, individuals in transition. And um, we see here a shift from you know, the connection to jobs, which was very much in the focus in the last, uh, I mean, up to probably 2020, uh, kind of connecting them to, to, to job and making these new jobs visible. I think um, that nowadays we see a shift toward or, or kind of a pivot toward more of the making people job ready, where, whether it is about, um, you know, refugees, whether it's about um, senior workers or, or people who want to do something else, or, or people who are coming out of, um, to, to, uh, to go back to the example I gave before, um, from, from industries we, which are in decline for certain jobs, right? So how do they uh, reposition? So I think here it's really like, uh, and I think Johannes, you, you also mentioned that, right? So what is the need of the, 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 the people we're talking to? And it's kind of how do we um, have them really, um, you know, consulted and coached versus just guided to the next job. So there is a big component here of, of, of skilling and job readiness. Now, so that's the, the, the first big block. And I think on, on that point, I think it's uh, that has been named as well um, by, by the earlier presenters. I think there, are, there is a triple effect on the people. It's on the people who are impacted directly. So that's a no brainer. And then um, you have those who are remaining within the organization. So that's also a place where uh, we we have uh, you know we have a we have a role to play, or we support organization because at the end of the day, it doesn't help if uh, you know um, as a, as a as a as a consequence of a badly managed mass layoff, the company is getting into more trouble. So there would be more uh, layoffs. And then the third um, effect is really on, uh, and that has been mentioned before, the those dependent on those jobs, right? So I think this is really important, the indirect um, effect of, um, particularly in case of mass layoffs, which is way less the case in, in smaller um, um, pro, um, projects or, or um, well, layoff activities. So that's for the one kind of one activity. The other activity um, is around upstream or what I call flanking support. It's more around a transformation consultancy, restructuring consultancy. So it's all about you know, workforce strategies. The example I gave before in terms of trying to, I mean, exploring what are the alternatives to layoffs, but also the whole work about, um, I mean, with the trade unions and works councils to see how we can reconcile the scenarios and make sure that you know there is an assurance that the people are being looked after. And then the third piece, and I think this is a, 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 in my view a, a, an important one that we uh, we not enough talk about is when a, what we call it reindustrialization. Um, so that's one word, but let me explain a little bit because there there is also there, there are other um, terms we can use in that context. So. It's the whole piece around when a closer needs to happen or happens, whether it's closing of a plant or it's a part of the business that, that, that closes, we help or reindustrialization or revitalization or however we want to call this is, um, is the, 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 the part about mitigating the impact on both real estate and people. Um, and so it's working with the employer and um, 
partly also with Republican authorities, but then it's uh, more prospective and it's more revitalization, but it's really about taking over the facilities and workforce. So it's looking for a new buyer, if you will, a new project to be attracted. So that will in, in the end mitigate uh, not just the, you know, the industrial uh, waste, but also the, the layoffs or the, the kind of mitigate the number of people who will lose their job directly and as said indirectly, um, which I think has been already mentioned in, um, in this group. And then, so that's really um, the, the, the biggest part of our work where we work with employers, but in many instances, and we would love to see that more often where um, we partner with communities and, and public authorities in regions to either do that when the company is not in position to, or even to anticipate and energize an economic area which is heavily dependent on, on one employer. So I think that's really something that we see there is legislation in, in France, um, but actually there is the practice is not, I mean, practice exists also in, in Spain or in Italy and other countries, but very little. So I think I'd love to hear like feedback also from, from uh, the people uh, listening and, and, and from the panel, whether, um, you know, we, we can talk a little bit about, about that, but I think this is really kind of um, beyond the core, which is taking care of and providing uh, um, um, perspective to the individuals. Um, it's really about building the new future around these jobs, um, because it will be eventually very difficult um, for in a case of a very mass layoff, and I'm sure we'll be hearing um, from, from the cases from, from Nokia or from the coal mines in, in Spain uh, with my fellow pa panelists later, right? It's kind of, it's difficult when you don't have alternatives in the certain region, it, it gets very, uh, very, very difficult. So if you allow me just um, a few more minutes, just wanted to share three learning. Yeah, Camille, could I ask you just to, because Julian has to leave at uh, four o'clock. Oh, right. could, I, could I ask, we'll go back to that maybe in the discussion. I apologize for that, but I, um, I wanted to get to Julian on the, exactly some of the examples that you were mentioning um, uh, on coal mines. Um, um, Julian Martinez Berahano, you um, are working for the Just Transition Institute and um, some of the work that you look at is really thinking about these places that are experiencing a mass layoff that is part also of, um, uh, of sort of an ecological transition. And I know you have to, to run soon. So why don't you just share with the group a little bit some of the experience that Spain has had and some of the lessons that you have for colleagues based on your experience and apologies that uh, um, it's uh, a bit tight on time, but look forward to hearing your, your thoughts from Spain. It's okay. Thank you very much, Karin. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very sorry for having to leave at 4 p.m. Just a couple of hours ago, I received this message that I have to end this important meeting at four, so I have to, I will have to leave at four p.m. sharp. But uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So as as my colleagues were explaining, well, you probably know Spain is is going through one of the fastest energy transitions in Europe and, and probably in the world. Um, only five years ago, coal represented around fifteen percent of our electricity mix, which for a uh, uh, an energy system as diversified as the Spanish one, 15% 15 is a lot. Uh, and five years later, we are in a situation where practically all coal mines have been closed and all coal power plants are whether shut down or in the process of uh, being shut down or, or their companies have plans to shut them down. So we are going through a very rapid process of energy transition and particularly in the coal sector and of course this has a very a huge impact and on workers that work in, in coal mines and coal power plants right in 2018 we had around 5,000 workers in in this sector um, whose whose sector is is disappearing so so they I think the interesting lesson learned about uh, our case uh, about Spain is that we are we were going in, in under a status quo scenario this was the typical mass layoff uh, uh, scenario where you have a sector that is closing down entirely and is being reconverted into a, a renewable energies and whatever other economic activity however we have implemented very, very, very strong policies on just transition. And as a result, we have not seen 
this scenario of mass layoffs. We are seeing a scenario of uh, challenges uh, on transition of workers, but we uh, have avoided a scenario of 5,000 people being uh, kicked out of work, let's say. So how do we do this? <laughs> well, in the first place, um, when we saw that coal mines and coal power plants were about to be shut down or were in the process of doing so, we sat down with all the main actors involved. So energy companies, coal companies that, uh, coal mining companies that have not gone into bankruptcy and trade unions. And we signed an agreement for the coal mining sector and the, for the coal power plant sector with these actors, so trade unions and companies, trade unions and companies. And in these, in these agreements, we, we achieved to have every party contribute in the, in, in the extent of their competencies um, for a just transition for affected workers and affected regions, right? Um, so what did we do in particular? Well, in, in, the case, in, the, in the case of public authorities, the Ministry of Ecological Transition, uh, first of all, we created the Just Transition Institute, which means that the, our ministry have a directorate of general solely devoted to just transition issues. That in itself is an interesting piece of governance and how to manage the transition. Right? Um, so for coal power plants workers, we one of the, the main achievements we got is that we, we mm, comp energy companies committed to relocate every worker uh, that, that worked for us um, in their own company. And for auxiliary workers, this is uh, workers that work for auxiliary businesses that provide the services to the coal power plant, but that were not, um, were not the, the energy company itself, energy companies committed to prioritize these auxiliary workers in dismantling activities and alternative investments in the region, for example, in renewable energies. Um, and we also created a job bank specifically for uh, workers affected by uh, the shutdown of coal power plants. So these auxiliary workers could sign up in these job banks and therefore provide a, an intermediary, um, a service of relocation in uh, and other economic activities in the area. And regarding coal miners, um, this was a more difficult situation because while energy companies continue to operate in the realm of renewable energies, in the case of coal mines, uh, most of most coal companies, mining companies, went into bankruptcy. So here, um, commitments by the by the mining companies were not as strong. So here, we intervened and financed early retirements for for workers and voluntary redundancies or economic support for those workers that could not. Uh, abide for uh, elder retirements, right? Um, so we had an uh, both in coal, in the coal um, power plant sector and coal mining sector, we had a, a variety of policies to to accompany workers into the transition. Um, and then another qu fundamental question for us was, well, beyond di workers directly affected by the, the transition. Um, what about the territories, right? What about the induced effects? So for this, we are deploying uh, a very strong spectrum of policies to support alternative economic activities, businesses, uh, entrepreneurs. We are supporting municipal projects and infrastructure, infrastructure projects to improve public services in these areas to attract other businesses and population that for them to want to live in in coal regions we are even promoting uh, cultural projects uh, to promote art, uh, young artists in, in cold regions um, and in all renewable energy schemes uh, to support hydrogen energy storage uh, renewables etc in the ministry we are also giving a prioritization criteria for cold regions um, so in the end what we did and what we are doing is to provide direct support for workers affected, 
and to really have a, a good identification of most affected areas and um, in these areas promote alternative job creation economic activities through a variety of policies so if i had to to summarize our lessons learned would be first governance is absolutely important we have a just transition strategy a directorate general solely devoted to this we have agreements with trade unions and companies we have I didn't get to talk about it, but we have the just transition agreements, which is a governance, a co-governance mechanism with regional governments and local governments to promote solutions and policies in these areas. So really thinking about your governance structure and what you want to do, and not solely reacting to a mass a scenario of of mass layoffs is really important. So, Karen, I think I have to go. <laughs> um, I provided, I, I sent you uh, some resources on, on our case in the industrial transition in Spain, the coal sector. Uh, please do share them with, with everybody in the, in, this, in the webinar. And thank you very much for the invitation. And, so, and very sorry for having to leave. Thank you so much, Julian, and uh, we appreciate the time constraints. So thank you for, for joining and we'll uh, continue the debate uh, building on some of your comments. Thank you so much, Julian, and thank you again for the for the documents. And I, I think, uh, you know, as he was alluding to in the end here, a lot of the links with um, with the territory and the attractiveness from an economic development perspective. And of course, the, the lead program here at the OECD, we really try to look at both sides of the coin, both uh, what are we doing from the employer side, but also what are we doing from the economic development side? and uh, uh, um, and the kind of uh, jobs that can be uh, created. So I'd like to now turn over um, the floor to Taylor Stuckert. Um, and uh, um, Taylor, you're you're dialing in from uh, from Ohio here. Um, so you're executive director of the Clinton County Regional Planning Commission. Um, and I think you know you've got a case uh, that was uh, the national news in the United States, um, which I think was quoted as being the ground zero for the recession. And uh, your community also is a place that is. This is not the first time they had a major uh, major hit to their local economy, which caused some maybe reflections for the the broader economic development model. So um, Taylor, maybe you could just talk, walk everybody through a little bit. Um, you know, what the what the area looks like, what happened when in this case it was DHL that had a, a really a, a very mass layoff um, and some of the reflections you've had on um, your economic development strategy um, going forward. So thank you again so much for, for dialing in from, uh, is it, you're in Wilmington, correct? Correct, yes. In Ohio, excellent. Thank you, Taylor, please. Yeah, so good morning, everyone from Ohio. Um, <clears throat> thank you for in inviting me to join this panel. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Taylor Stuckert. I'm the executive director of the Clinton County Regional Planning Commission, and we're based in uh, in Wilmington and Southern Ohio. And I actually started my work here in the midst of a mass layoff event, so kind of came in with a unique perspective. Uh, the Regional Planning Commission was founded in 1970 as a planning agency covering the entirety of the county, uh, primarily focused on long range planning while supporting initiatives that affect the physical, social and economic development of the county. So we're really involved in a lot of different areas of the community. To give you some geographic context, uh, Clinton County uh, has the county seat of Wilmington. We're located in the southwestern portion of Ohio, which is a Midwestern state in the US. Uh, we're a rural area, but we are proximate to three metro regions. So Cincinnati, Dayton and Columbus. Uh, all of which uh, are about a one hour car uh, drive by car or less. Uh, Wilmington's population is a little over 12,000 uh, residents and Clinton County has a population of about 42,000. And our population has been pretty flat over the last few decades. And this was even the case uh, during many years of economic growth in the county. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. But um, physically, the city of Wilmington is like many US rural towns. Uh, we have a discernible urban core surrounded by uh, vast amounts of agricultural land. Uh, what makes Wilmington unique, uh, if you look at it on an aerial map, you'll see the Wilmington Air Park, uh, which is about 2000 acres or about 800 hectares. Uh, it's about, it's nearly the size of the town itself. Uh, the Air Park began as an Air Force base in the 1950s uh, which, as Karen mentioned, uh, was decommissioned in the early 70s, which in of itself was a scary mass layoff situation, has its own unique story. 
Uh, but eventually the air park was acquired by Airborne Express in the early 1980s. And Airborne grew about 2% every year. And in 2003, uh, sold the air park to shipping company DHL, um, which received nearly half a billion dollars in incentives to locate its domestic shipping operations to Wilmington. Uh, and DHL invested nearly a quarter of a billion dollars in the facility uh, in their time here. Um, they provided so many jobs, 10,000 at its peak, uh, that workers had to be bussed in from around the region. Uh, to, the air park accounted for over a third of the jobs in our county. And there was at least one employee from over half, uh, 45 of the 88 counties in Ohio, working at the air park every day. And it was the largest source of employment for a six county region. So it was a very large single site employer in the state at the time. In the fall of 2008, uh, DHL announced due to a combination of factors that it would be swiftly closing its Wilmington operations. Uh, and as Karen mentioned, Wilmington made headlines during the Great Recession with nearly 10,000 uh, people losing their jobs pretty much overnight. Uh, we were thrust into the national media spotlight. This is right as the Great Recession was starting to gain traction. Uh, and we were labeled the ground zero or poster child of the Great Recession by uh, many national media outlets um, who were covering the story. Um, <clears throat> and while the main story was the unprecedented ma uh, mass layoff event, for those of us working locally in economic development and planning, the story really was much more complex and dynamic and, and is much more complex and dynamic than that. Um, you know, it became qu clear that uh, through the years of prosperity that we really failed to nurture the entirety of the economic ecosystem. And we were, as we like to say, intoxicated with the air park and the jobs that it created. Uh, this caused us to overlook uh, some of the underlying insidious side effects that come with such a large homogenous source of economic activity, uh, caused us to ignore many of the warning signs of economic vulnerability. And while federal, state, and local leadership provided you know, a lot of the traditional top-down strategies uh, for addressing economic disasters, such as job placement, skills training, educational opportunities for affected workers, uh, many of us were really encouraging a more nuanced response to this mass layoff situation. Uh, and considering many of the symptoms and economic vulnerabilities that existed in the lead up to the, the mass layoff, uh, we, our work really focused on identifying ways that the community could adopt an economic redevelopment strategy that it would address not just the need for you know, jobs, but also the areas of economic vulnerability that have been uh, overlooked for many years. Uh, simply put, our efforts were really focused on addressing the leakages in the local economy rather than just economic inflow. And it was an attempt to provide a response that was locally driven, more bottom up, rather than relying exclusively on top down traditional redevelopment strategies. Um, as I mentioned, during the GHL days, the economic inflow from in commuting, economic multipliers, residual activity was really quite powerful and plenty. And, and as I stated, so much so that it was quite easy to ignore any of the leakages or underlying economic challenges that had been accumulating through the years. Some examples of these issues uh, were things such as declining local entrepreneurship, lack of small and medium sized employers, uh, which were historically crowded out due to the vacuum effect that the air park had on local employment. We had, uh, as I mentioned, two struggles with population retention and attraction, very stagnant uh, population, even with years of economic prosperity. So people were not moving, many were leaving. Uh, we had an issue of brain drain and declining educational attainment. I think this kind of uh, aligns a bit with what Victor was describing. Um, a lot of our workforce sort of uh, were focused in low skill job opportunities that did not offer a lot of alternatives should they lose their job. Um, other economic leakages, such as energy production and efficiencies, uh, undeveloped economic opportunities, such as leveraging our agricultural base to build a more robust local food economy. Uh, and and we, through this work, we developed a suite of programs that touch each of those areas and more, and it would take a whole webinar to cover. But the important takeaway uh, is that this work really started with community conversations about these challenges and opportunities in the face of the mass layoff event. Um, the severity of the crisis really created a unique opportunity and created the space for the community to come together to have conversations that we were not having. The community was not engaged in economic development, and this created that opportunity. Um, and this experience, and in general, an over-reliance on one employer or a dominant sector is something that many rural communities across Ohio and the United States have and are still experiencing. 
Uh, following the loss of DHL, the air park was donated to our county port authority and at that time had four employers and 750 employees and today it's grown to 15 employers and 35 employees. So we're seeing a lot of that diversification coming out of this event. One of our goals has been to allow for our situation to really be a lesson, not just for ourselves, but for other communities of the dangers of traditional economic development strategies that place an unhealthy and strict focus on job growth without aligning to other community values or priorities or strategies that build resiliency in the economy rather than increasing vulnerability and exposure to the conditions that can cause mass layoffs. Um, and as I mentioned, Karen, in the lead up to this, you know, a lot of people locally really like to, to think we would like to put this, this layoff event behind us and, and focus forward. But uh, many of us working in planning and development in the community really um, view this experience as a valuable reminder of the blind spots that can develop in economic development strategies. And we, we continue to utilize this experience to inform uh, our future economic development planning. So uh, that's kind of the background. Uh, I'm happy to share more about maybe where we are today and, and uh, speak to some of the other panelists if we have some time, but thanks for having me. Great, thank you so much, Taylor. And, uh, and I think, you know, the, you know, the idea that you mentioned and I know has been written about this case where, um, you know, how do you rebuild that set of entrepreneurs locally who have that strong embeddedness who are less likely to then, you know, uh, create future mass layoffs or how do you make sure that people see what are some of these economic opportunities to invest in training and education because that started to, to decline as well. So um, I think this is really um, a great story for colleagues to understand uh, a bit more what are the what are the challenges, as you said, with this um, traditional, I don't know if you want to call it elephant hunting type model of, um, of economic development and how you're going a bit more bottom up as a, a source of durable job creation and vitality for the community. You mentioned also community values, which I think uh, harks back also to some of the discussions we heard with, um, with Victor when he was looking also at some of the different communities and how in some cases they were able to, to come together so that people felt less isolated in these, um, in these challenges. Um, I wanna turn uh, now to uh, Aria because um, Aria, you have a case um, with uh, with Finland, and you've had um, support also from I think the European Globalization uh, Adjustment Fund, and looking at different cases. But um, area, you've you've also had a, an interesting situation where you had mass layoffs, but also on the high end uh, in terms of the skill spectrum. Um, and so this was sort of a big a big change for how you do work uh, in Finland in, in addressing some of these mass layoffs. So welcome again, Arya, to, to joining us from Finland um, and look forward to hearing a little bit about some of the adjustments you made when you were experiencing these mass layoffs in Finland. Yes, thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> Finland is a member of European Union, and we have used EU funds to support redundants from big, big mass layoffs in Finland. The fund we have mostly used is European Globalization Adjustment Fund for displaced workers. And we have got support for training, coaching, and other, other measures for, for the redundants. As an example, I will tell you about Nokia's and Microsoft's redundancies from 2012 to 2007, when we had seven projects, altogether about 10,000 redundants. Uh, the project sizes varied from 500 to 4,000 redundants. And Finland is a small country with 5.5 million inhabitants. And we just had one Nokia. We have a lot of other industries, but for the IT, the Finnish economic economy was quite dependent on, on Nokia. But you perhaps remember that the Nokia phones disappeared from the market and because everyone wanted to buy a new iPhone. And then Nokia 
had to terminate a lot of jobs. And also after Microsoft had bought the mobile phone industry, they noticed that it didn't succeed. And then we also had Microsoft's redundancies. Uh, the biggest challenges were in the first projects, because then there we learned a lot of things. Uh, in Finland, uh, EGF is used by PES, Public Employment Services, UC's European Globalization Transition Fund. And in PES, they were used to take care of mostly blue collar workers. That's, that was their normal clients, or of course, some white collar workers, but normally blue collar workers. Not well educated white collar IT professionals with high salaries and long careers. Uh, it was presumed that, that these people would have known better how to apply a job, how to use LinkedIn, and so on. Uh, the normal way to, to handle these kind of people was that they can take care of themselves. But what to, but what to do if you have 4,000 unemployed there? Uh, the first thing we noticed, I was then working there as a project manager, uh, that they are like the blue collar workers, only their working environment, standard of living, network and education level were different. Uh, the Nokias, redundance, they had no experience of how to make good application. They could update their LinkedIn profile because they knew how to use computer, but they couldn't update it in that way that they could had had a new job. They couldn't look for hidden jobs. They they couldn't uh, they didn't know how to use their network or they they were not able to find work in other branches where they could have used their old competencies. So in in normal cases in Finland, PES is alone responsible in big redundancies. In this case, company and PES supported each others. The company had some very good programs. They gave a lot of support in establishing new companies. Uh, but their programs were quite short. Uh, the EGF funding could give us two years time to help these redundants. It wasn't always, we didn't always need the whole time for every, everyone, of course, but, but it was very good for some people that we, have, we had that, that two years. Uh, EGF funding was used to buy tailor-made trainings for IT professionals. IT training is of course given by PES, but it's not always tailor-made from PES. And EGF funding was used for individual coaching. It means that for each each person separately. Uh, PES Normal uses group coaching in Finland. And the, every project had own employment specialists serving only this client group. And what we, we learned is that in getting new job, the basic problems are same for blue and white collar workers. 
job qualification and possibilities are different, but both need help. Uh, so what we learned, learned is that don't leave the white collar workers without help. Um, tailor made trainings and individual coaching were essential in helping the redundants to get new jobs. Be aware that you may need special training and coaching tools for specialized white collar redundants. This means individual coaching where the competencies in all jobs are traced and matched with the quali qualifications of jobs in different branches. So, for example, if you have difficulties in finding a new job in mobile phone industry, you should look or find out in which other industry or branch you could use your competencies. And uh, what we noticed that if there are a lot of redundants of one company or one business, it's very good if they could be organized in projects. And the final solution of these projects was that uh, about from 75 to 90 percent got new positions. That's what I have to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aria. And I think it's really interesting to um, to share with everybody the fact that yes, while you know maybe individually um, certain kinds of workers they might have more advantages in some way in the labor market. When you have four thousand of them at the same time, we might have some challenges. And um, so I think that was a very important message also as we think about other transitions coming, you know, uh, coming our way with artificial intelligence and others where, you know, it's not just limited to, for example, coal mines or, or auto industries. It can be uh, something much broader and different programs and in public employment services um, might need to adapt to those different uh, communities and groups. Um, I see we have just a, a few minutes, uh, a few minutes left. So maybe for each of the panelists who want to jump in on this. Um, we we talked a lot about you know the importance of the sort of regional dimension a bit of the focus of this uh this discussion today and the links between the the employment side and the and the economic development side um has anyone uh just out of curiosity seen anything helpful in terms of the data to help with some of these more challenging local main markets we heard for example johannes you had an, an example in a, a good labor market where people could find new jobs relatively easily in that sector. Um, but there are communities where it was harder to place. Johannes mentioned uh, the sort of small shops in, in rural areas. And, um, you know, we had uh, Taylor who mentioned a bit more about, you know, when you had such a massive employer in, in one location that was really um, crowding out other kinds of employers. So have you, what kind of data are you using to help with reorienting a bit um, some of these potential workers um, in in that are subject to a mass layoff. I don't know if anyone has seen anything on the data front they want to share, because there are that that's going to be a, a tough one in terms of helping to redirect going forward the kinds of trainings that are relevant for the local labor markets. Um, Johannes, please, and and any other panelists, please feel free to uh, to jump in on that. No. Of course, the, mo the most simple data is to show the vacancies and to compare it with the unemployed uh, person in the same region, which, which is, I would say, the most impressive uh, example of showing that there is work in that field, enough work in that field. So that's uh, the most, but mostly it's also a question of um, testing the people of their interests, of their possibilities to learn to certain fields. Yeah, but... Um, I mean, I think this is daily business for public employment services. Yeah. Yeah, I would add that, um, you know, I think we're it's still sort of preliminary, but um, we're starting to turn our attention primarily to uh, technology and innovation, um, you know, and looking at vulnerability from the standpoint of automation, um, you know, because automation is going to affect 
both employer resiliency, they need to become more automated to be more resilient uh, in rural communities to so their ability to stay, but it also increases vulnerability to employment. So uh, finding ways to work with educational institutions to partner on uh, sort of creative and, and new ways to uh, align skills and educational opportunities for both young people and adults to sort of uh, be in, engaged in and in interacting with the uh, innovation and technology sectors. Great, thanks, uh, thanks Taylor. Um, Yoyal, I see you might have some comments, and also it would be interesting to talk a little bit about the the way that uh, you're sort of preempting, in a sense, some of the work was you, as you're talking to firms to avert actually a mass layoff, because we saw from some of the other presentations, um, particularly um, Victor and Taylor, about what happens when it does occur and how you have to pick up the pieces. So be curious to learn a little bit more about the sort of um, the efforts you're doing to help uh, companies actually avert these mass layoffs and then any other thoughts you had as well that you want to contribute. Right, um, it's a, that's a very big question. <laughs> so let me uh, maybe just one comment um, on the on the data point. I think uh, what we're doing is a is a is a combination between uh, well, obviously, you know, helping um, half a million people to transition every year gives us some data to see <clears throat> where are they transitioning to, where are the uh, the biggest shifts between sectors. So. And that's something we're tracking. That's our own data. The other piece is on the, <clears throat> we, we are um, building a employability index to better um, equip our um, our consultants and coaches to kind of, uh, you know, have, have more in their hands when it comes to, you know, understanding to areas point before, right? We have a lot of different people um, and, and they all have very individual needs depending on their tenure, what the skills level, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's kind of, so, so and so that's, that the, the two pieces are internal in terms of our own data. The other piece is we are um, partnering with um, with other organization like uh, TechScurna, Skyhive and others on the market who are, um, you know, providing some visibility on where are the skills in demand and and, and where are, you know where are the skills in, in supply? So I think that's um, you know if you're looking for very specific ones, I think there are um, a few a few different um, 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 you know tools or, or data providers on the market. Um, <clears throat> now in terms of your the, your your big question, um, what what is the work that we do? So I think uh, you know I, I think I would say one one part is working with the employers and kind of. Um, you know, emphasizing the, the 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 importance of how can how are they perceived on the market, um, because managing such a process like that, I think that's been coming across uh, for, from every single panelist here, right? It's it can be super detriment, detrimental, of course, for the individuals, but in the same way, impacting the organization and their ability to continue their economic growth. So it's really kind of creating the link between uh, this durable future for individuals individuals and, and how they manage that uh, on their own. <clears throat> and the other piece is really like, it's more of an appeal, I would say also for, um, for uh, the representative of public authorities, right? How thinking about how do we, um, and I think Johannes, you mentioned something like that as well uh, in, your, in your speech about how do we create these incentives without impacting necessarily the taxpayer, as in how do we call for the employer's responsibility in the whole, let's say, sustainable employment and kind of um, agile labor market um, and their ability or their responsibility from the start to the end of the employment and how you know how they can work with that and I think an example a good example here is on in France where there is this um, 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 uh, the obligation for an employer to in a case of a, of a significant layoff to come up or to compensate for the loss right or the economic impact on the region so i think these are the elements where you know um it, it closes the circle in a certain sense right there are lots of actors um on on the market to support when it's happened right and and i think we can talk about that but we also should talk about how do we make sure that it happens or that it um that we get this anticipation mode and we don't wait until this happens Great, thank you so much, Muriel. And I think, uh, Bessel, in your data, you saw a uh, much fewer frequency of mass layoffs in France in some uh, some cases as well. I think that might help explain part of it. Um, I see we're drawing to a close, so maybe if each of the panelists just has one 
final parting thought that they want the uh, the group to sort of take away uh, in terms of a lesson that they have seen um, with respect to the management uh, up either upfront or uh, post a, a mass layoff. So anyone who wants to jump in from the panel, um, feel free to give your your final remarks as we close out here today's webinar. Yeah, so I will just jump it off. So I, I mean, I, of course, I looked at my research at what is the negative consequences, but I think what I take away from this from this interesting discussion that we had today is that there are so many um, margins where there is resilience in a community, and they can think about policies that can uh, look forward to to anticipate that such things might be happening in the future, prepare people in the appropriate way. But even if you are not anticipating, there are ways that you can transfer people internally to other jobs, other sectors, uh, and keep them in the region and, and have opportunities to make them do better. But of course, the economic circumstances in the region are, are, are very important to, to make that successful. Right, and I think actually Johannes answered some questions in the chat here and the question and answer about the importance of these regional partners as well and knowing with whom to work, what the workers are uh, could transition to, and 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 what they what they need in order to make this uh, picture work for the the wider community. Um, anyone else want to jump in with any final thoughts? Yeah, I'll just uh, add on to that. You know, I, I I I've felt you know sort of coming of age in this DHL situation that you know as a as a federal government we do we have a very robust federal uh, infrastructure around natural disaster planning and sort of warning systems and flood insurance policies, but we have almost nothing geared towards economic disaster planning and warning systems. And uh, I often felt looking back, especially in hindsight, that in our situation, there should have been many red flags from the federal and state levels on our vulnerability to disaster. Uh, and we could have done a lot of work to be uh, proactively preparing for uh, a potential mass layoff event and how we might re you know, respond to that and how we could be sort of planning ahead and, and building some resiliency while we had prosperity building. So it's certainly a, a key takeaway from our situation. And I just want to emphasize the importance of social support at all yeah. levels, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, having peer helpers at a adjustment center, kind of uh, counseling their former coworkers, uh, or more broadly, uh, you know, these public private partnerships that uh, folks were talking uh, so articulately about, uh, those make a difference and can we tap pre-existing ties and a sense of common destiny uh, within our communities as opposed to blaming people for their job losses and, and so on. I think that importance of values and culture uh, really uh, stands out there. Great, thanks so much. Aria, you wanted to jump in on that? I see you unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm very happy that after quite big mass redundancies, uh, quite many cities have survived. People have survived. They've got new jobs. There's always something uh, positive happening, although although it's quite difficult situations also. Yeah, I think this resiliency point was really coming out, I think, in a lot of the, the remarks. So I just want to thank all of you, Johannes, Taylor, Muriel, Eria, uh, Vessel, and, and Victor, and Julian, who joined us uh, a bit earlier. Thank you so much for this uh, really um, dynamic discussion today. Um, so we'll follow up uh, to those who were uh, joining in the webinar with some of the materials, and if uh, any of the panelists want us to um, also send links to um, to colleagues in a follow up email so they can learn more in depth about some of the different items you raised during the call. Um, we look forward to doing so and thank you all again uh, for your uh, participation here today and look forward to uh, to circulating as well when uh, Vessel's paper is published a little bit more about some of the quantitative evidence we have uh, at the regional scale. So um, look forward to seeing colleagues at different uh, future events of the local development forum and um, wish everybody a nice uh, morning or afternoon, wherever uh, time zone you're calling in from uh, today. Thanks again. Thank you.